Hello, my name is Jan. Hopefully all of you are here for a bug bounty hunting talk. If not, you still have like a minute to leave. Otherwise, this probably will be uh, a bit too boring for you. Uh, nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, this talk, uh, you should expect just like a light begin beginning talk. Uh, we should not dive into like any too technical details. Uh, though feel free to interrupt at any point, feel free to ask any, any questions. Uh, I'm perfectly, perf perfectly fine with saying I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about and we will just continue or I will try to answer to the best of my, best of my abilities. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Jan and this will be bug bounty hunting talk. Feel free to come in guys. Uh, also, if I'm not uh, loud enough for the recording, uh, by the way, hi guys, we're online, then, then just tell me. All right, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the doors, that would be disturbing. All right, so uh, what's in front of us? Uh, first, I would like to give a bit of my background on how did I end up bug bounty hunting. Uh, what uh, things did I manage to maybe do or find? Uh, then I will tell you a bit more about today-to-day -to -day, uh, things that you do as a bug bounty hunter, where do you do it, how do you do it. Then I will tell a bit more about things that you actually are expected to do and things that you are not expected to do. By the way, maybe just let's start show hands who uh, knows what the bug bounty hunting is. Okay, good. Who is a bug bounty hunter? Okay, that's good as well, so I can say, or was there a raise hand? Okay, 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 sure, sure, that's good, that's good. Uh, and then I will try to give you a bit of a demo, or it won't be a live demo, the technic uh, technology is failing me today, so unfortunately I cannot do it live, but maybe it's for the better. Uh, first, um, what's my background? Well, I, oops, and this. <laughs> okay, perfect. What did I do? So I pressed different button and, and things. <laughs> That's a great start, okay. So, let's just start the presentation again. Perfect. Cool, things break, that's why we can hunt for bugs. So, that was <laughs> unplanned demo. All right, uh, so at the end I would like to uh, end with a, with a demo, just like to show you. Uh, practical reports that might be interesting for you. Uh, what's my background? I did some mathematics. I'm trying to, or saying this because you can come from any, any background. It doesn't, doesn't matter what was your original, maybe uh, what, what did you pursue originally, but don't worry, there won't be that many equations. Uh, every equation in slides is bad as I heard, so let's not go there. I worked for some corporates. I worked for smaller companies, and uh, I also did some uh, Forensic analysis, not this type of forensic analysis, rather this type of forensic analysis. So just looking into bits and bytes and try to get some uh, meaning out of them. And uh, right now I'm doing a PhD at Crocs uh, at a different faculty. So if you are confused about where the venue of DEFCONF is, there are two faculties in Brno and the, the other one is, is my alma mater. Um, and I ended up doing Babontis roughly uh, two years back during, during COVID. And I worked on various programs or companies, so you might recognize GitLab or GitHub. Maybe you, you don't recognize this one. I think it's Ivan or some like different company. Uh, I also find something uh, during COVID um, in one of the U European Union projects for uh, digital COVID certificates. Uh, there are also programs or companies that uh, do not disclose that they are running bug bounty program and that uh, those programs are considered private. So some of the things that I will be telling you about, I won't be telling uh, precisely in details. Uh, what, what, what's the company, for example. Uh, word of caution, just a disclaimer, I'm not inv inviting you or giving you the, uh, the right to just like go hack on the internet, of course, like that's up to you and your responsibility, so just so that the lawyers are satisfied. Also, um, everything that I'm saying is on behalf of me and not, not my employer. Uh, right, so bug bounty hunting, founding bugs, founding security issues, vulnerabilities, is it actually ethical? Uh, well, the, the state of the things evolved, 
But thankfully nowadays, there are ways how you can just go hack on someone else's software, meaning that you just like go uh, as, as much as you can, go deep, go wide, try to find issues, try to uh, leak data from, from the website, try to do remote code execution or whatever, and still remain ethical. So it's sort of like a win-win situation. You will learn something, you might get uh, or gain some bounties, the companies will eventually get more secure. So that's. Uh, that's where we are at right now. It wasn't always the case, so I'm quite quite happy about this. Uh, I'm not sure what are your expectations, even like from this talk, but it's like, okay, I want to see whether I should get into bug bounty hunting. I feel like often the misconception is that it's some kind of like a get rich quick scheme that you just like, okay, I'm, I, I know software, right? I will just like sit down and play around and find bugs and some, maybe some RC and suddenly like I, uh, I will make a lot of bugs. So, I would discourage this approach just because like, it might take you a few months before you find actually something reasonable uh, that someone else on the other side of the globe will be willing to pay you for, uh, even though you two have never met before. Uh, though to sort of start on the more uh, nice side, yes, it is possible to, to make some bucks. And I'm worried to press another button here because I would like to show you. Is this, is this the laser, do you know? Let's give it a try. Okay, that's a list. Cool, cool. So, uh, what are you looking at? This is a GitHub page of Shopify. That's an e-commerce platform that allows you, within like just a few clicks, uh, create your um, e-shop and you can sell goods or whatever to to customers. So, a lot of money flows maybe directly through Shopify or indirectly from some from some other other banks that are involved. And I mean, it's a good company, right? They have GitHub, so they must be like a good software-wise. But uh, only as long as another guy like Augusto shows up and, and just like throughout other project that he's working on, he stumbles upon some repository that maybe he want to use or something. And so he's like looking into the code and suddenly like there's, oh, there's a .n file. And you're looking at the report that he created for Shopify. And so he was going through some, some uh, Shopify's code and suddenly there was that end file. It's like, that's a configuration file, right? So first he was like, I'm not interested in that because I'm looking for the functionalities of the code. But then like, it contains GitHub token. And what's the point of GitHub token? Well, you get read or write access to the repositories, right? So to all the things that I was showing you here, this is one repository, but to other repositories as well. So, just like he stumbled on it maybe as a, uh, just by chance, but it's quite critical, right? Because now you can do backdoor of all Shopify products. It is even authorized because you are using GitHub token, right? So it's like you are not hacking through the software, uh, through the server to, to change the production software. And, and what's the payout? Well, it's 50 grand, right? So like, that's, that, that's a sum that probably people would be willing to switch jobs for and just go hunt bugs. But again, like, uh, especially finding valid GitHub tokens, nowadays it's, 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 I would say, quite rare. GitHub scans for all the code. The tokens nowadays are not just like some random byte strings, but they are also annotated or there's a tag like this is GitHub token or Shopify token, something, and so you can just grab for them for every commit. And so finds like these are quite, quite rare. Nonetheless, they still happen, but don't go into bug bounty just, just for the money. However, what I can promise that you will get out of bug bounty hunting uh, is uh, learning or, or knowledge. So uh, I cannot stress this enough, like this is basically infinite amount of uh, sort of opportunities or possibilities to learn interesting so, uh, things. So if you are into this and you say, yes, please, I want to learn, uh, then Definitely, definitely go go ahead. You can basically go as wide as you want, as deep as you want. If you have like a language that you would like to work on, uh, you can just find a project that is a program uh, listed as a bug bounty program, and you can just spend your time there. And not just you learn, but you, if you find something, you can go then report it and maybe get get a few few bucks out of it. Uh, there was one thing, like what maybe your motivation should be. Now, I don't want to offend anyone, uh, but I, even though we are sort of developer community and there are like, we have points that we feel strong about and we are um, on the same boat, I would still try to convey that f for hackers, the, the intentions are quite different. Uh, I know people, 
often I want to reinvent the wheel and they want to create new projects and so it's like, ah, yeah, new features like project manager will be happy, customers will be happy, but like uh, some kind of bug fix, like I don't care. Like the, the bug shouldn't be there, right? But it's, it's, uh, it doesn't bring anything new. For, for the hacker, that's like precisely where, where we want to look. And it's like if you read documentation and you write as a developer, this endpoint is authenticated, like I don't trust you. I don't care that you, that you want this endpoint to be authenticated. I will just like make few curl calls and, and see whether it actually is. Uh, if you say uh, you cannot enumerate uh, whatever emails through the reset password feature because we are rate limited uh, or it's rate limited, well, have you tried that it? it's actually rate limited? Maybe you are running through some, uh, uh, some uh, cloud fraud or something and the rate limit breaks in, uh, in the, in the path, so uh, just uh, hackers will go and test all the claims that you have, so they basically uh, uh, have this uh, as their motivation. Uh, over, uh, all right, so if you want to go and actually start hacking, uh, hacking ethically, there are a multitude of programs, so there's HackerOne, there's Integrity, Bug Crowd as well. Maybe another question, is there anyone from a company and that you know that you have a bug bounty program so that Okay, two, cool. So basically, maybe you are using like one of these platforms as a company. Uh, it's basically a game of, of three entities. Me as the hacker, uh, the companies, for example, GitLab or GitHub that are running the program, and the platform itself. The platform is sort of like a, a mediator between those three. Because you can also imagine, and that's a question that I often get, like how do you know that they will actually pay you, right? You, you spend like weeks and weeks, you are finding all those like good vulnerabilities that, that you can exploit, but then you just like leak the information to the company, they fix it and then just like, ah, like we knew about it and, and like we, we won't pay you a thing. Uh, so that's why, or one of the reasons why, why it's good to have the platform as well, because the platform sees the communication between the company and, and the researcher, and they can say, hey, yeah, like, you, you are claiming that, that you are not obliged to pay, but we have this in the terms of conditions in the contract with the company that, that you are supposed to pay, and we will, we will make sure. So that's, that's uh, what sort of enables this to actually be, be practical. Also, for the company, it's much easier. They just, like... Uh, I haven't run a program, so I can't like, uh, this necessarily go into the details, but I imagine that the company just gives a bulk of money to, to the platform, and the platform then can just like pay to the researchers, uh, so it's, uh, it's quite a smooth process. Uh, all right, again, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me uh, as, as I go. Uh, so if you go to a platform, you make an account, and you want to uh, go check a program, so what programs do we have? So there are public programs and private programs. The public programs are usually like the, the big players do have them, right? Everyone knows there's a GitLab, GitHub, Facebook, uh, Google, whatever. So it doesn't make sense to hide the fact that they have a program. They are also quite big so that they can manage the program. If you imagine that just like the whole world goes hack uh, on GitLab, it will create so much potential noise for the company to go through. Uh, so the big players are public, some sm smaller companies are private. The, one of the reasons it's not like they are trying to obscure the fact, but they simply are starting the process. So if you are in a company and you are thinking like, is bug bounty program something for us? Well, there's one way how you can get into, just have a private program, just uh, say to the platform, okay, we expect only like few tens of reports because we don't have the manpower to, to go through all of that. Uh, so this is sort of the uh, page for, for the program. There are some statistics like how many reports have been resolved. This is not really uh, up to date as, as of today. So uh, don't take it as a, as a fact for now, but there are at least 1,000 reports on GitLab. One nice thing, for example, is the uh, response efficiency, because you can imagine that you spend weeks finding the bugs, then you report, and then you just sit and wait. And here, you would expect it's probably better than in some open source project that only one person manages, but I can tell you that it can like, take weeks, or, or uh, and now you're sitting on possibly like remote code execution, and just like nothing, nothing happens. So 10 hours for GitLab, that's, like, that's exceptional. Uh, and of course, like we are interested probably also in the, what are the categories and what, what amount you can, uh, amounts you can actually actually get. And so there are low things for just a few hundred bucks. So if you find just like uh, something like, oh, you leak email address here and a few addresses here and so nothing that important, that's probably like a low. If you get remote code execution, SQL injection, things like this, it's, that's critical. Uh, 
uh, that's another another program uh, that can be private, for example. But uh, this one was just redacted uh, for the purpose of the talk, and it's it's GitHub. Actually, they also get a good good response efficiency. Uh, another important part or aspect is the policy. So, what actually makes this legal or, or ethical? So, as part of the as part of the page that you've seen, there is also just a policy, just straight up text like you can do A and you cannot do B. Uh, I'm not from the USA, but I know about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which basically, to my understanding, says like, if it's not yours, don't touch it digitally, like, yeah, like you're not authorized to do so. But GitHub uh, has especially, or the programs do especially say, like you are authorized to do this as long as you follow this policy. Uh, Though if you violate, so, sorry, violate certain restrictions, uh, you suddenly go beyond this policy and it might just mean that, okay, we are interested in the report but we are not paying you anything or we ban you from our program or we ban you completely from the platform or maybe uh, even more severe consequences. The policies differ quite a lot. So this is GitHub, that's quite nice. Like GitHub is a software company, right? So they understand a lot of the things. Uh, PayPal, on the other hand, has something in the policy that can even this uh, sort of make you not want to uh, report to them. You don't have to read the whole thing, but basically they say, if you report to us, you hereby grant PayPal, and not just PayPal, but basically anyone we choose to, like subsidiaries, affiliates, customers, uh, irrevocable right or license to the things that, you, that you've given us, okay? It's non-exclusive, so hopefully it's still your, it still is yours, but we can publish, distribute, we can sell, offer for sale, and do whatever. And this, like, for, for some researchers, this is like, well, I, I, I don't want to get into this. Like, I want to just submit a report. I'm not giving you a license to just go sell it suddenly. Uh, and they even explicitly say, like, well, don't submit to us if, if you don't want to. And I can, uh, I can tell you, like, this, this uh, was one of the reasons not to submit to, to PayPal, for example. Uh, so that was sort of on the high level. Uh, now what you can do and cannot do so the next thing, it's the explicit listing of things that you can hack on. So those can be any assets you imagine. Those could be IP address ranges, just like from this range to this IP address, you can hack whatever, you can scan, you can run automatic tools. It can be just the GitHub repository. It can be Android, iOS app. It can be like a hardware product, maybe hardware wallet that, that you can hack. And with those things, like do whatever you want. Like green is good, but those are, those are things that like you cannot touch. Maybe the company acquired like a small business, so now you know that it's part of the bigger business, but they are first going internally, trying to fix all the issues that, are, that they are able to, to fix. Uh, and you can really break things, as you can probably imagine, if you like try remote code execution on a pro production website and, and you, you break everything. Uh, the next thing that's important is, is impact. Maybe you are, like, if you want to contribute to open source, like, people care about, like, typos in documentation, small things, small bug fixes, like, things like these. But for bug bounty hunting, it's like we want something that's actually practical, that there is an impact. Like, if you leak one email, uh, maybe, like, we don't care that email probably exists on the, on the website somewhere or on the internet somewhere as well. But if you leak, uh, like, the whole database, or if you have remote code execution, like, yes, we do care. And this differs per program, so it's not like you get a denial of service on GitLab and GitHub will pay you the same or even more. That's, uh, that's what I experienced, like GitLab said, yes, this is high severity, we want this. <laughs> GitHub says, oh, denial of service, sorry, we don't care, like, uh, that's, that's not, even, not even low. And so, for example, self-cross-site scripting, meaning that you can save on the website your JavaScript, but it only affects you, so for example, it's in your I don't know, like bio that only you see or something like that. They don't care. It's it's XSS. That's good, but it's uh, it's not impactful. Impactful. Uh, right. So uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, right now, I would like to get into more specific reports. Uh, unfortunately, the the ones that I uh, reported are not disclosed, so I cannot go through these. But there is one guy, William Bowling, that uh, does seriously good stuff on Hacker One, and it's all disclosed, so we can just look through the reports, and hopefully, you will see as like how good of a resource the the activities are. Um, so. 
one thing that I have mentioned is that the platform sort of gamify the whole experience. So right now there, there are things like rank. Okay, for William, for some reason, he doesn't have a rank assigned, but basically you can say like, oh, those are the top 10 hackers in this year, the top 10 hackers on this, on this program. There is some kind of general reputation, like this guy knows what he's doing. There is some impact. So like if he reports, it's really impactful, okay? It's not like just some rubbish that maybe uh, would cost something, but not, not in general. And then there is a signal, like if he says something, it's not noise, like you should go and listen to his stuff. Uh, you can see that uh, Vax, by the way, if, if he ever listens to this, thanks a lot. That's really good research, research and the resources. And for him, it just works to, to uh, go direct to GitLab and to specialize on GitLab because it's not a, not a small feat, right? I'm not sure if you are familiar with Ruby, Go, all the backend stuff. You, you can deploy different Docker instances and see how all these things interact together. So it makes sense to just like go specify on, on GitLab. Uh, I also said that like you should uh, not go it, uh, for it, uh, in it for the money, but you can see that for Wax it, it kind of kind of works nicely. He has several arbitrary file reads, so if you have a server, you have slash etc slash password, you can get it. You have remote code execution, stored cross-site scripting, another remote code execution, another one, another file read, etc. Uh, so that's uh, that's very very good stuff. Uh, and we will go through one of uh, one of these. Uh, I suppose all of you are familiar with GitLab. I don't have to explain. You you share code, you version code, you create issues, so you can write some text. You can get the XSS. Uh, that's, uh, that's just for the examples. But now, remote code execution when removing uh, metadata with exif tool. So who knows what exif tool is? Okay, so imagine you have a JPEG, you, you take a picture, and it stores also GPS location, timestamps, what kind of device took this picture, right? If you imagine that you would have access to all the data of all the profile pictures of GitLab, you would know basically the location of like several thousands of people, right? So that's, that would be an issue. So what GitLab does, it takes exif tool and run it, uh, run the images through this tool and it strips the metadata. It can strip the GPS location, oh sorry. Uh, it can strip the GPS location, it can strip, um, whatever, what the device took the picture. And so what they do, they have a runner, GitLab Workhorse, and whatever you upload for images, at least conceptually, it goes through this tool, it strips the metadata. But there is a clash of like what GitLab uh, expects and what the tool expects. Okay, GitLab just goes, uh, and maybe it would be best if I show you the code. So let's see. Okay, so we have something like this. Uh, you upload an image and it goes to uh, some part of code that asks, is this exif file? So should we run it through the exif tool? Well, there are some regex, that's, that's always good for bug bounty hunters if there are regexes. So we just check, is this JPEG, JPEG with E or TIFF? And if it is, we mark it as, as a, something that we, we should uh, take care of. Uh, the next thing is uh, the problem where Okay, so GitLab thinks that uh, based on this code that you should go through it, but once you go through exif tool, it doesn't check the extension, but it checks the header of the file, just like reads a few bytes and see like what kind of tool it is. And so you might actually end up with a different parser that parses DJVU. And I have no idea what that is, but as a hacker, I don't really have to care. But my point is that I'm able to uh, make this clash of what you expect and what the tool expects. And so you suddenly can feed any file and make it parsed by this kind of parser. And unfortunately, it's possible to get to a state where even though there is some check, so there's maybe, again, some regexes, but the, the JPEG file that will get parsed will suddenly end up being evaluated. So if you've been to any basic 101 uh, faculty course on, on uh, security coding, secure coding principles, like do not write, evaluate, or system calls, or whatever, because suddenly it, they can end up here, and the file that Wax has uploaded will get uh, evaluated. And the payload, sort of, the file that he uploads, is not that complex. You can just see it down here, so it's just uh, this thing. So you get some metadata, uh, some copyright, whatever, then this is the crucial bit. You escape a new line, suddenly all the checks break, and then you can just run arbitrary parallel. So you just echo vax into slash temp slash vax, so just like a proof of concept. This is, by the way, a very good example of how you can 
prove to them that this indeed works, for example, on GitLab com. You just create a temporary file, no harm done. You don't touch any ATC password. You don't try to like, oh, like I'm such a good hacker, like I can remove something from the database. No, 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 you just like show them I can run Echo, that's it. Like now they know, and now you have a report for, for 20 grand. Uh, the whole sort of steps to reproduce are only those two five. So just download this payload, you create a new snippet on GitLab, you uh, attach the file, you select an upload, and suddenly the file will appear on, on the server. Nothing too complex. There's lots of text to sort of describe, but this is, those are the reports that, that if you want to learn things, just go to hackerone.com slash hacktivity and find these, these reports. Uh, maybe one uh, more that I can show you that's also, so this was a remote code execution, right? So this is, it, that's very good. But maybe you can just get arbitrary file read and how this can happen. Uh, again, it was critical. There was some path traversal, traversal, meaning that our input hit some code that can traverse your file system and maybe retrieve file that you weren't expecting uh, the user to, to end up with. Again, serious bounty for that if you are into that. Uh, actually, one thing that I haven't mentioned, like the people that read this on the other side are not necessarily like as good as the researchers as you are, right? And so sometimes it's just nice to attach a half a minute video of like what actually can happen. And so thanks to that, we can try to watch this. Basically, again, we have a GitLab. I'll just comment it. So there is some GitLab. Uh, you don't even need to like have access to some special, special project. Uh, you only need two projects, projects that you can create yourself. Uh, you create a new issue. So whatever, some issue, and you paste a special payload. So if you know Markdown, this is like a link or attachment A, and it goes to some slash upload slash 1111, and then now we see the path traversal, or at least the, the attempt. So we are jumping into the parent directories. Oh, hey, and now we have the ETC password. That's the, that's the file that we are uh, up to. And this is just like a comment in snippet, right? Like how, how can this have any, any effect? So you save the issue, uh, and now you have the issue. And what you can do with GitLab is you can move issues between projects. So we just say like, oh, this was the wrong project. I want to move it to a different project. So let's see what happens. So you move it to some different Vox project. And suddenly, yeah, it worked. So you have issue. There is a sudden attachment with password. You can download it, and uh, if you view it, hey, that's, that's etc password from GitLab.com. Uh, so again, all credits uh, to Wax for, for this very nice find. Uh, is it hard to recreate? Well, you just saw, like, just create projects, add an issue, copy paste this, where you change the file that you are interested in. Uh, this markdown is broken, but just like move the issue to the second project, and that's, that's it, three steps, and, and you have your file. Uh, however, finding the issue is, is, the, is the crucial bit. And, and that's, that's, that's hard, but if you as a company run Bug Bounty program, you incentivize researchers, hackers all over the world to just like go spend some afternoon or maybe more afternoons because understanding GitLab will take some time, but because, or thanks to it being open source, you can just like, it's out there, like you can just go and, and see and try to find issues like this. And, and basically, that's, uh, that's about it. To wrap up, uh, a few things. Okay. So those were the slides for the issues. Uh, what things can you hack on? Well, there is also Internet Bug Bounty program where basically the big players put money into one big bag and then you can pay out for different small projects. So if you find something on Rust or Rails or Curl or LibSSH, Nginx or OpenSSL, and not just like the software projects like the ones we know, but for example, Extra, which is a project between different countries in the uh, northern part of Europe, so Estonia, uh, Norway, etc. they are using this as a data exchange layer, so they also run a bug bounty program. And not only these things, but also European Union cares about things like Mastodon or LibreOffice. So you have on integrity, you can just like go hunt, go hunt on these. Uh, Google, of course, they have a whole platform for themselves. 
They can, by the way, support also researchers for uh, just like they give you budget. If they, if they trust you and your knowledge and you say, okay, I'm going to fix this open source project for maybe a few weeks. So that's also another possibility. Uh, I haven't talked much about tools. Like you can imagine, you can do all sorts of analysis. You, you can automate all different things. Uh, one thing that I would stress is like you find a bug. The platform or the program tells, yeah, we fixed it. Well, then you just go and check whether they actually fixed it. This was probably the easiest money that I ever made. I just re-ran one curl command and said like, no, no, you, you haven't fixed it. And within a few minutes, I get a few hundred bucks more because they just saw that like the, their fix was not working and they got this immediate response. Uh, so yeah, there's a bunch of tools, uh, no time to spend uh, talking about those. Uh, there are nice resources that you can have a look around. Uh, the activity on HackerOne, there are nice podcasts, critical thinking, zero day, or more, if you are more into cryptography, there is a security cryptography, whatever podcast, very nice one. And I will also suggest one of my friends, which is Mr. Problemo. It's a Czech podcast, not really about bug bounty hunting, but rather about various ways how to think about things. And I think that's related because you sort of have to step out of the regular developer creating issues or f features writing code. You want to really understand how things work and interact. And so be careful because there is a user input everywhere and it can get very nasty. It can be quite easy as, as we've seen. And stay safe. Uh, that's basically all from my side. And if you have any, any questions, uh, hit me. And also, we'll stay around in the hallway if you, if you want to discuss. Uh, with that, thanks a lot. Uh, that's it. OK, so the question is, how do the private programs work? They basically work the same way. You have to be invited. So after you report a few things that actually make some sense, they have impact, you will suddenly start receiving emails from HackerOne saying, like, yeah, we want you to hack. Interestingly, interestingly you only have like a week to, to actually uh, uh, submit the, the or, or respond to the to that uh, program. And there are various things also, like people just have a, like, a window of two weeks where you can get like twice the, the payouts for, for the issues, and it differs per the programs. You can also be kicked out of the program if you don't hack on them. OK, any other questions? Yeah, there's a very nice question. What do you do if the company that you found bug in doesn't have any program? Uh, I would say they should have. So as, it, as soon as you do uh, any website or whatever, at least have your email there that you can access. If they don't have, uh, it sort of depends. Like I've been in cases where I found various tokens that, uh, for example, for GitLab, if you find uh, uh, active token, you can just query one a API endpoint and see whether the token works. So sometimes you can like check whether it's a valid find and uh, you get the email address of the one uh, who, to whom the uh, token works. So you can just submit to them directly. Uh, sometimes I just try to just search for security at that company or just like any, any email. Uh, and sometimes you just don't get any response and like that's it, the, the end of story and they, they probably don't care. Yeah, it's sometimes hard. Uh, we have one more minute for questions. So last one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, nice question. Yeah, nice question. Thanks. I, I, think I, I think I get it. So basically, how do you start? Do you go through various services? Do you just hunt for one buck? Uh, the one thing that you suggested, just like if you are good with, I don't know, networking or like TLS, just like go try to uh, like go for Nginx and try to see how the code behaves there in, in the areas that you do understand. That's, that's a good start. If you just like don't know, there are capture flex games where you can just like play around and you will get the uh, get the results or like you will learn more easily because the things are prepared for you to learn more. 
Uh, if you know a little bit more and want to find the good stuff, go read the Hectivity reports and then try to recreate them. Uh, and, but it's like, it, it varies. Like for example, I didn't know PHP, but I wanted to just like see what are the bugs in PHP about. And so I was just going through PHP projects and learning PHP and uh, finding things there. Uh, it can take time. It can be like months before you actually find something impactful. Okay, uh, I think it's, we are out of time. I'm not sure whether the chair agrees. If so, then. <laughs> Okay, if you have any more questions, I'll be around. Feel free to ask me. Uh, otherwise, thanks for listening and have a nice rest of DEF CON. <laughs>